Arsenal family, hey, what's going on? Welcome back to another Monday Night Arsenal experience. My name is Demarcus, and I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Hey, I know some of you guys are getting off work, maybe cooking dinner, things like that. So for you to be here with us is greatly appreciated, and I hope that uh, we make it all worth it. Hey, before we get going, definitely get this video out, get it out to those who maybe aren't watching just yet, because I promise you they too uh, will be blessed by this. But hey, enough of me. With that being said, I want to introduce you to some of my friends. As a collective, they're known as the Arsenal Band, and they're going to lead us in worship. Take us away, Arsenal. spoken word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so your foe, still your love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after. 
after me There's no wall you won't kick down Light you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me Oh, you're coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Light you won't tear down Coming after me Till I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Yeah Shaking, oh my heart is in. 
Hey, Arsenal family, welcome back to another Arsenal online experience. Hey, I'm Chad Ballou. I am the lead pastor here at this community that we call the Arsenal, and we are stoked that you chose to spend your Monday night or any other night that you're watching this with us. So we appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Hey, tonight I'm going to talk about God's will. How do we know what it is? How do we find it? How do we stay in it? And can we be out of it? 
Anyway, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. It's something I struggled with for a lot of my life. And so hopefully it resonates with you tonight. So we are going to jump into this new series that we are calling In the Mystery. It is a study of the book of Colossians, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Little history on this. Colossae is in modern day Turkey. It's over close to like Asia Minor, the, the lower Asia or lower part of Asia, it's close to the Middle East. And this is where Colossae was. It's actually funny enough, it's, it's a historic city town that is no longer or that has not been excavated yet. It's still it's still kind of under it's hidden. So it, it's interesting. It it was this. It's a city that's close to Laodice- Laodicea. Um, it is a place where this church of the Colossians had been planted. The church wasn't planted by Paul himself. Paul, the apostle um, of Jesus, that that took this message of Jesus and the gospel to the Gentiles. He wrote this letter to this church. He didn't plant it. A coworker, a friend of his. Epaphras, Epaphras um, planted this church. And so he's actually from Colossae. He plants this church. He goes to Paul. And we see in the beginning of this book of Colossians in chapter one, we see that he has given a report to Paul. He's letting Paul know just how the Colossians are doing, how, how this community is operating, how they are loving their neighbors, loving people. In fact, Paul says that. He says, we, we can see the love that you have. We, we see that. And then he's going to touch on throughout this book some of the things that they're struggling with, some some things that they're walking through, like um, ideas that they have to slide back in underneath the law. And Gentiles actually were never under the law, but that they that they must follow the law. There's things that they must do in order to be good enough for God. And Paul's going to address that and say this is not true. This is a lie. He's going to talk about some of the. The other, like kind of Gnosticism, some of the ideas of other religions that uh, the Colossi, the Colossians would have dealt with at the time, and how those are inaccurate and not pointing us to Jesus. And and really, the theme of this book is going to talk about the mystery of Jesus and the Messiahship of Jesus. How how Jesus is so important in this story. And so it's a fun book. It's an incredible letter. Paul has some some phenomenal just gospel truths in here. So we're excited to take these next few weeks to walk through the book of Colossians and study it. So we're going to talk today, like I said, about the will of God. What is God's will? In verses 1 through 6, Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, and he he just greets them. That's a typical thing that Paul does in his letters. He greets them, lets them know he's been thinking about them, um, lets them know really who he is. And, and he mentions Epaphras and, and how he has mentioned to him what is happening in this community. We're going to pick this up. In verse 7 today, chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 7, we'll pick it up. It's a prayer that Paul prayed for the people of Colossae, for the Colossians. He, he prays this prayer for them. And there's some things that jumped out at me in the prayer. Really, one main one that I, I want to just kind of dig in on today and see what you have to think about it as well. But first off, we love to do these questions. Um, it's community chat. So what it, it what it what I need from you is for you to engage a little bit. So I know this is online and so this is in the chats, but in the chats, answer me this. What did you or do you want to be when you grow up? We all had these ideas of like, this is what we're going to do. This is who we want to be. This is this is how I want to do my life when I grow up, right? I like to tell people all the time that like, I still haven't figured out what I'm going to do when I grow up. Like, I'm, I'm still working through that. Um, right now, I'm enjoying where I'm at and I'm loving this community and I'm loving what I'm doing. Maybe one day I'll grow up. I don't know. But really, my the one thing that I, I wanted to be when I grow up was a baseball player. I wanted to be a professional baseball. I thought this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And I know most kids at some point think that we're going to make the the pros. And if we, if you played sports growing up, you probably thought you were going to be a professional. And I, I really did. I thought professional baseball was going to be it. In fact, I played a lot. I was on traveling teams. I did all kinds of stuff. I thought this is going to be it. We moved to San Antonio from Oklahoma. 
And Oklahoma is where I was playing a lot, traveling a lot. We moved to San Antonio, and I didn't play as much. And things started to kind of dwindle. And even in high school, I didn't play. There's a big story there, but um, I didn't play on our high school team. And so I, and that was it. I realized that my dream of being a baseball player was not actually going to come true. It's interesting, like the ideas that we have, that we'll, things that we want to be or, or things that we, we, we think we're going to do change over time, right? Like maybe you're like me and you've put some things in the chat that you wanted to be when you grow up and maybe you didn't do that. I know some people who wanted to be very specific things and did that. Like I know I, a guy who was like, I'm going to fly fighter jets. And he did it like like from a kid. He, he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to school for this. I'm going to I'm going to get the grades. I'm going to get into the academy. I'm going to do all this. And he did it. it for most of us. That's not how this works. Our, our ideas of what we can do change. I'm a little bit ADD and figuring out what I'm going to do when I grow up kind of freaks me out. <laughs> like If you look at my college transcripts, I I have an associate's degree in the language Persian Farsi. Don't try and speak it to me. I don't know it anymore. I did it when I was in the military, but I don't speak it. So I have an associate's in Persian Farsi. I have 180 credit hours in so many majors that I don't actually have a bachelor's degree. So I, I'm, I'm all over the place. I've jumped all over. I've tried this. I like this. I'm going to do this. I would change my major. And I ended up just not even finishing because I've got so many credit hours that just don't interact with each other. Um, probably the closest to like uh, doing something in design, but that's about it. Like I went to Bible college. I went to art school. I've done language school, I, uh, interrogation, like, like that kind of stuff. Like I've done so many things that my mind has changed on what I wanted to be when I grow up, what I really thought I was like, made to do. And as I was reading through Colossians 1, the prayer that Paul prays for the Colossians and the way that I, that I read it in some different translations really stood out to me because really what happened through my, my younger years and then into college, I, I changed what I wanted to do. And And eventually what came into my decision making was, what does God want me to do? What is, what is God's will for my life? What, what am I made for? What, what is that one thing that God really expects of me while I'm on this earth? And when I read this prayer from Paul and I saw a couple different translations, just reading different biblical translations, a couple things stood out to me that I'd never really seen before. Let me show you. In Colossians 1 verse 7, it says this. This is Paul speaking to the church of Colossae, to the Colossians in this community. He says, Our beloved co-worker, Epaphras, was there from the beginning to thoroughly teach you the astonishing revelation of the gospel, and he serves you faithfully as Christ's representative. So he's he's talking about the pastor of this community, right? The person that has planted, that is leading, that is sharing in this revelation of the gospel with this community of people. So Paul's saying, I know that you've heard this, that he is he is faithfully a representative of Christ and he's sharing the gospel with you. He goes on, he says, he's informed us of the many wonderful way, ways love is being demonstrated through your lives by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I love this. It's the, it's the pastor bragging on his community like, man, they are loving people around them. You should see the different ways, the creative ways that they're loving. That's something that we talk about at the Arsenal quite a bit. Like we want to come up with creative ways to love our neighbor. Like what, what are some creative ways that we can do this, that we can really show God's love? And he says, empowered by the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit operates in and through you, you are loving well. Thank you for that. He goes on in verse 9, he says, Since we first heard about you, we've kept you always in our prayers. The we he's referring to is Paul and his disciple Timothy, those two. He says, Since we've heard about you, we've kept you always in our prayers, that you would receive the perfect knowledge, look at this, of God's pleasure over your lives, making you reservoirs of every kind of wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is what popped out to me. His prayer is that that this this group of people would receive the perfect knowledge of God's pleasure over their lives. 
This word that is used for pleasure here is, is also translated in other versions. If you're reading the ESV or NIV or something like that, it'll say God's will. That God's will for that. I, I pray that you would receive the perfect, that you would understand God's will for your lives, right? But in other translations, in this one, it says God's pleasure over your life. In another translation, it says that you might be overwhelmed with God's dream for your lives, Man, when I read this, it, it it almost completely rearranged my thinking on what God's will really means. Like it, it if you think about like what is God's will for my life? This is a question that I that I asked myself a lot, that I feel like other people ask me a lot. And at times it became like a burden. Like, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I'm trying to figure that out, but what do I do right now? And for me, at times, it felt very almost debilitating. Like, I can't do anything because I haven't figured out God's will. Like, after after realizing that I wasn't going to be a professional baseball player, it's because I got hurt. That's why I got hurt. My arm just couldn't, just couldn't throw as well. And that, that's why I couldn't. But anyway, I figured out I couldn't be a professional baseball player. And after I figured that out, I made this big leap of wanting to be a youth pastor. And I, I really, I mean, truly felt like God called me into this, this place to be a youth pastor, to lead students, to work with students. So it, it wasn't something that I just came up with. I really felt like this is God's will for me. This is God's plan for me. This is what he wants for me. So I went to Bible college. And wouldn't you know it, my first year at Bible college, the Bible college starts a baseball team. God's will, bro. I'm in it. Let's go. We're going to play some baseball. So so I'm there. I'm at Bible college. I'm going to be a youth pastor. But then they started a baseball team. Like, maybe God is leading me in this direction. And so I try out. I make the team. This is it. I'm going to be a professional baseball player and maybe youth pastor. So I'm doing those things. I really do. I end up, I, I, I get hurt, need um, surgery on my elbow. But Really, the reason I couldn't go back to school is because I couldn't afford it, and my GPA was like a 1.6. <laughs> so my parents were like, you're not doing well in the whole school department, so we, we can't keep paying for you to go. So I, I, I dropped out of Bible college, and th- this was just the original kind of step in my life of where I'm like, man, I'm, I'm falling out of God's will for my life. Like, I what am I going to do? And I, I ended up, I got a phone call from a recruiter for the army that was just random. And he was like, Hey, well, have you ever thought about the army? We'll pay for your school. I just dropped out of school because I couldn't afford it. They'll pay for it. This sounds like a win-win. So I go to the recruiter. I talk to him. I sign up. I'm like, man, I'm going to go back to school. Maybe I'll be a professional baseball player and I'm going to be in the army. So I do all this. I join the army and there's no chance to go back to school. I'm training. I get sent to Iraq. I get sent back. I'm in training. I get sent to Iraq. I get back. Like I did some schooling, but there was no chance of me going to school and trying to be a professional baseball player or, or becoming a youth pastor. Like it just wasn't happening. And then throughout this process, many of you know this, but some of you may not throughout this process, throughout the military, like I, I dropped out of Bible college. I got married to the girl that I met at Bible college. I joined the military, we head off, and then a couple years in the military, I'm getting ready to deploy for my second deployment, and we get a divorce. This is a major moment in my life with me and God. I knew in this moment that God's will for my life, I'd walked out of it. This is what I'd been told my whole life. God's, God's will for my life was that I, that I become a youth pastor, that I that I get married and I have kids and then I'm that this is this is the wife that I'm with for forever that if I get a divorce I've severed my ties with God's will and I, I'll not be able to operate in any form of ministry this, this is what I and like I said many of you have heard this story this is what I thought this is what I'd heard this is what I'd been told and I I remember in Iraq on a deployment reading and and thinking about scripture and this guy Paul who wrote this book of Colossians I remember reading his story and be like he was way worse than I was 
He did so many more things. And, and you let him write two-thirds of the New Testament and, and take the gospel message to the Gentiles. And I got a divorce and I'm I'm done? Like, you're done with me? You've thrown me out? And I remember, like, well-meaning people being like, oh, no, no, God's, God, God still lo- loves you. Like, you can still be his, in and go to church and do it, but you'll never be used by him in the way that you expected, that you, you're you going to have to find a new calling in your life because God's will for your life, you didn't walk in it. So from the moment I went to Bible college, almost 20 years go by. Is that right? Not 20. 12 years go by. Almost 12 years go by. And I get the opportunity to help in a youth group. And I remember stepping in and taking this this volunteer position and helping as a youth pastor in in a youth ministry and I remember wondering, like, can God really use me? Like, what what, what has happened? I've I've stepped out of God's will, so how do I operate in this? And it it snowballs, and it turns into me stepping into a part-time role as a youth pastor, and I'm speaking every week now, and I'm I'm spending time with students. I'm taking students to youth camps, and and I'm, I'm in a role that I never thought I'd be allowed to be in. And I remember having the conversation with the executive pastor at the church who wanted to start paying me for the stuff I was already volunteering for. And he's like, hey, we're going to bring you on part time. We'd love to pay you for what you're doing. We want you to be the youth pastor. And I, I was like, man, I can't. Like, you you know my my past. You know that I'm divorced and like that God can't use me in that in that way. And I remember the youth or the executive pastor looking at me and being like, man, you've been lied to. God's grace is sufficient for you. God's grace has 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 laid out a place where you are a new creation and you can step into the place that God is using you right now. It was such a weight lifted off of my shoulders because God's will for my life had been so burdensome. Have you ever wondered what God's will is for your life? Have you ever wondered like am I am I ever going to figure it out? Am I am I am I living in it? Am I walking? Am I am I am I outside of the boundaries of it? Am I have I lost it? Did I do something that God is now mad at me and I can't operate in that place anymore? And as I read this this prayer for the Colossians that Paul has written, and it, and when I look like the the words aren't just translated just to be translated this way. It's because this word will that they use for God's will in the Greek can also mean pleasure or dream. It, it, it has those definitions as well. And so when I read this, it really reminds me that God's will for my life should not be something that stresses me out or that I'm worried about or that I, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to walk in. But God's will for my life is that I understand how much pleasure he takes in me. God's will for your life is that you would understand how much pleasure he takes in you. And and in knowing that knowledge and accepting that knowledge and understanding that God takes pleasure in doing life with you, then we have the knowledge of God's love for us and it reminds us of who we are. It reminds us that we are children of God. It reminds us that he enjoys us. That there's not something I must do in order to impress him. That there's not something I must do in order to make God like me more. But that God loves me. He likes me. He takes pleasure in my life. He has dreams for my life, just like I have dreams for my children. But on a God level. Now, when I begin to really wrap my head around God's will, God's pleasure for my life, it's not about, am I in the right job? Am I marrying the exact same person that God made for me? Am I, am I doing everything like following each like major thing that God laid out that I have to figure out, right? Like it's a puzzle that I've got to figure out and put together in life. That's not God's will. 
Now, when I understand that God takes pleasure in my life and he takes pleasure in doing life with me, then will that inform decisions I make? Absolutely. That's called knowledge and wisdom. That is that is that is wisdom that we receive from the spirit. That is spiritual understanding. That is when I understand who I am in Christ, when I understand that God takes pleasure in my life with me, then I can use the wisdom that I've received from the spirit to make healthy choices to set up boundaries in my life. But this is not something where I must walk a tightrope in order to stay in God's will. No, God says that he's called us and he set us free for freedom, that we get to enjoy life. I love when Brittany, Brittany gave an analogy one time in her message that it's like we're on a playground and we can, God's like, just go play. It's like with my kids, like I don't tell my kids the best way to play on the swing set. In fact, I enjoy when they come up with new things. It's fun for me to watch my kids be creative and come up with ways that they're enjoying life. And I believe that theologically for me, when I step back and say that God is way more interested in how I accept and understand the pleasure that he takes in me and our relationship than than he is in in me walking a tightrope, then the pieces really start falling together for me. I begin to understand that this is much more about a relationship with God where he enjoys me and I get to walk with him. He, he wants me to enjoy life and not be worried and stressed. In fact, it says in the in scripture that perfect love casts out fear. So why would we use this idea that if I'm not in God's will, he's mad at me to motivate me? That's using fear and fear is not a good motivator. It can motivate someone for a short time, but it's not sustainable. Because just like me, eventually when I realize that I, I, I'm not walking the tightrope that God, that God laid out for me that I must do in order to keep him happy, as, as I realize I'm not doing that, I just gave up. Like I, I can't do this. But the beautiful thing is that our God who is love pursued me. Just like he pursues you, he pursues because he's loving, because he takes pleasure in our lives. He, he wants to see us experience his love and share it with others. This is God's will. It opens up so many opportunities. It, it sets us at a place where I realize I'm loved, I'm accepted, I'm forgiven. I get to now do life with a God that is love, who takes pleasure and actually likes me. This, this sets this whole thing up now where I, I'm not worried anymore. In fact, I have joy and peace. I get to share love and kindness. This is what the gospel has done. And just this short scripture reminded me of this as Paul prayed this prayer for the Colossians. And when I realized this, when I begin to understand that God's pleasures in my life are what, what is guiding this, not him making sure that I'm walking a tightrope, then when Paul continues the prayer and he says that we pray that you would walk in the ways of true righteousness, pleasing God in every good thing you do, I take this, this phrase and I realize that pleasing God in everything you do is not a mandate. My kids, when they're enjoying life and they realize that I, I'm, I'm watching with a smile and I'm, I'm, I, I love that they're having fun, when they realize that, it's so pleasing to watch them have fun. I think this isn't a mandate of God, God being like, you must do this. Paul says, we pray that you would walk in the ways of true righteousness. What's he mean? In, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God. So I am this. What Paul is saying is when you realize that God takes pleasure in you and he walks with you, he's got... He's got these ideas and dreams for your life. When you realize that he loves you that much, you will operate as who you are as a new creation. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You will operate this way. And as you're operating this way, it's pleasing to God because he's watching you be the best version that you can be because that's who he created you to be. It says then you'll, you'll become fruit bearing branches, yielding to his life and maturing in the rich experiences of knowing God in his fullness. 
What does maturity look like? It's understanding who God is, understanding the love that he has for me, understanding the pleasure that he takes in me, and then sharing that with others. I'm going to wrap it up here because I, I, I believe when we look at God's will and reframe it as God taking pleasure in our lives or God having dreams for our life, to me it's encouraging, not debilitating. It's freeing, not restricting. God loves you. He takes pleasure in doing life with you. He wants to see you enjoy the freedoms that he has set us free through his son, Jesus, into this world so that we might share his love with those around us. That is what the gospel is all about. Not about these sets of rules and boundaries that I must strictly follow, but about experiencing God's love and sharing that love, experiencing God's grace and sharing that grace, experiencing God's forgiveness, his full forgiveness and sharing that forgiveness. It is experiencing the life that we receive through Christ that God has given us and sharing that life with others. That's what God takes pleasure in as we realize this life of Christ that we have stepped into, that we realize what the gospel has truly set us free for. So my hope for you today is that you are not restricted by this idea that you, you're having to walk a tight tightrope in the will of God, but that you realize that God takes so much pleasure in you, that he enjoys you, that he, he wants to see you experience life and freedom the way that he meant it to be, that you feel a little more free today, a little less stressed. Maybe you can roll your shoulders out a little bit and feel, feel a little more lively. May you experience the life and love of Christ in a new way today so that you can share it with others because you get to go love well. It's just who we've truly been made to be. We'll see you next time, Arsenal. I love you. I can't wait to see you Sunday in person or here online. Have a good one. Arsenal family, thank you all so much for hanging out with us. Before you get going, we just want to remind you that you are loved and that we appreciate you so much just for being with us in this moment. Um, so before you go, hey, watch one of these videos. Don't forget to like, subscribe, maybe even comment what your favorite thing was about this service. And with that being said, Arsenal, have an amazing week. We love you so much and we can't wait to see you next week.